This is the Horse Radio Network. Hi, I'm Jennifer Wood. And I'm Jennifer Connor from Equestrian Businesswomen. And you're listening to Equestrian B2B, the podcast that brings together industry leaders, entrepreneurs, and equestrians for conversations about how they build and sustain a successful business. On today's show, we are speaking to Shona Rotondo and Ashley Tietrich, who will talk about their experience in the world of equestrian marketing and how to improve marketing for your brand. Shona Rotondo is a lifelong equestrian with a rich background in marketing and communications. A Boston University graduate, Shona spent over a decade in agency roles navigating the evolution of social and digital marketing for companies like Reebok, IBM, and the Breeders' Cup World Championships. In 2016, she co-founded Grand Slam Social LLC, a boutique social media agency that focuses on marketing strategies for horse racing and equestrian brands. As the head of marketing at My Racehorse, Shona focuses on overall positioning, strategy, and execution to drive CRM and customer acquisition. She also contributes to global marketing initiatives designed to create a consistent brand experience in new regions like Australia, UK, and Ireland. Shona assists with My Racehorse partnership discussions and the development of deals with events, tracks, and other partners. Outside of the office, you can find her at the barn riding horses, spending time with her young daughter, a horse racing fanatic in the making, or at the racetrack trying to hit a pick five with her husband. Owner and breeder Ashley Tietrich is the wife of Harness Racing Hall of Fame driver Tim Tietrich. She resides with her family on their farm in Swedesboro, New Jersey. Having gained international experience from traveling worldwide with her husband, Ashley has gained a unique perspective on the sport of harness racing. In 2015, she created Tietrich Racing to promote their brand to fans through numerous social media platforms. Her marketing plan was very successful and moved into creating TietrichRacingGear.com, where she promotes their branded clothing with sales in the United States and 18 different countries. With her platform, she has gained some great marketing partnerships with Walsh Company, New Vocations Racehorse Adoption Program, and Ernst Benz. Ashley is very passionate about aftercare and was a speaker at the 2015 World Trotting Conference in Australia and is a strong advocate for finding horses second careers after racing. A graduate of Purdue University with a degree in business marketing, Ashley worked as the marketing and sales director for Frank's Pharmacy, a respected equine pharmaceutical company, for six years prior to having her daughter, Trista. With her entrepreneurial spirit, Ashley manages their horse business as well as promoting the Tietrich Racing brand to their 40,000 plus followers on social media. Ashley is a current Women's Pro Rodeo Association competitor and New Jersey director for the National Barrel Horse Association. She has combined her love for riding, racing, and marketing of the sport to fans all over the world. The Saratoga Women in Business Spectacular is the first ever horse show created by women, operated by women, benefiting women's health, and showcasing women in business. This one-of-a-kind, extraordinary event is one you will not want to miss and is open to all competitors, both men and women, in the equestrian community. The Saratoga WIB Spectacular Horse Show is a USEF A-rated jumper three-star competition from July 13th through 17th, 2022, in Stillwater, New York. The Saratoga WIB Spectacular will partner and collaborate with equestrian businesswomen on this initiative. Exhibitors and attendees will be offered educational opportunities throughout the show and beyond to meet, interact, listen, and learn from a variety of remarkable women willing to share information about their careers and the paths they chose. For information on how to support Saratoga WIB Spectacular, visit www.saratogahorseshows.com. We're so excited to have you guys here on the podcast to talk about marketing and your experience in the equine industry. So thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. 
Yeah. It's yeah. Great. So starting out, we kind of wanted to just cover some basic thoughts about marketing and have you guys give your feedback on them. Shona, maybe you can start. Our first question is, how do you start putting together a marketing strategy? Can you like walk us through some examples of building that out? Yeah, definitely. I actually started in more of the social media marketing space. So I founded a company called Grand Slam Social in 2016. And we really wanted to bring true strategy and, and an element of science and analytics to social media. Just understanding that was... At the time, it was in the racing world, kind of on the brink of being considered a legitimate marketing and business tool. Maybe some other industries had already accepted that and embraced that, but in racing, it was still kind of in earlier stages. And we started Grand Slam to be a resource for equestrian and horse racing businesses specifically, because we knew how difficult it is to navigate social media, but also through the lens of working within racing. So there's, it's not as easy as just selling a makeup product online or, or something like that. It's very nuanced. So we started really developing a strategy brief for social media and the building blocks of that are relatable to any strategy you're building. So whether it's for social media specifically, or if it's for broader marketing efforts, it all starts with the strategy brief. And the first step is tons of research. So we look at macro trends in marketing, we look at industry trends, and then we look at consumer trends within our own community. Try to kind of dig into all of those different spaces and come away with some learnings about tactically where things are going and how people are using platforms and digesting content these days. And that kind of helps set the goals that you're going after. So you could look at a macro trend and say, you know, video is king. And then you look at your consumer trends and say, all right, my community that I'm marketing to spends most of the time on Facebook. Then you go to Facebook best practices and you see the ideal length of video for Facebook. Typically it's 30 seconds a minute. And then you build, you set your goals and you say, okay, I want to increase my, vi my 30 second plus video views by X percent this year. And so then that kind of leads to your KPIs. So after you do the research, understand the community and set the goals, then what we like to do is have what I call an informed creative brainstorm. <laughs> so if you like, everyone's always like, oh yeah, let's just brainstorm. And if it's not led properly, in my opinion, it could be it could be wasteful. And what I've learned is working in smaller businesses, sometimes you don't have a team to brainstorm with. Like it could be marketing party of one and you're doing email and you're doing social and you're doing PR and you're doing everything. And so what I always recommend is if you don't need people within your department to join the brainstorm, you just need people in the company to join it. So if you have a really well laid out brainstorm guided document. I think it's totally acceptable to ask your CEO, ask you know people on the board, like whatever your whatever the components of your company are. Invite everyone to join that brainstorm. You'll look smart because you've done all your research, right? And then you'll get a ton of different perspectives, which I think is really helpful. So then, after you do the creative brainstorm, that's where your content program ideas will will come from. And you'll have these awesome, you know, you'll dial in on what your message is going to be and what the look is going to be and how it's all going to come together. And then the most important part is distribution strategy. So I think a lot of people think that a good idea is just going to work. And unfortunately, in this day and age, that's not the case because it's content overload. So yeah. you really have to be smart about paid, earned, owned properties really figuring out and being smart about where you're going to spend your money against this content to make sure it gets delivered to the right audience. And then what are the earned capabilities? And earned could take place on social media too. Like organic social, you could be getting a lot of earned reach from those platforms, but then there's traditional PR efforts and things like that. And then I always feel like people kind of forget about their owned properties in a way. Like Think about all the touch points you have with your brand. So 
just taking my resource, for example. So that's the company that that I'm now head of marketing for US operations at, at my resource. And every time we have a campaign, we have email, we have our app, which has public and private capabilities. So you can do a public app update, which is like a mass blast to everyone who's downloaded the app. And then you have private app message capabilities to specific ownership groups. So you could look at that by region, where the horses are, things like that. We have our website. We have social media platforms. You have your paid social platforms. We have partners. So there's all these different places that you can that, that can all come together. You, know, you're, you could create a landing page. You could have a web banner. There's all these different tactical ways that you can deliver your message. So that's probably the last component of it. And then just making sure that you have analytics in place. So how are you tracking success? Set your KPIs to track back to those goals that you have. And I think (laughs) marketing changes really quickly. And I've learned to flex in various directions, just being part of what's still a startup. So I think my final kind of piece of the puzzle is just testing and learning. Like, don't feel like you need to have this perfectly developed marketing plan and strategy. Yeah. And you need, I call it a kill switch. You need to be comfortable with that kill switch. So like if you come up with this great campaign and you spend all this time developing it and you're like, this is going to crush and then you launch it and it just, it's like, goes, goes nowhere. It goes yeah. nowhere. You just, you have to just be like, that didn't work. Let's try again. And you can Let's go try back. something else. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You can go back to that process again, there's definitely going to be nuggets in that brainstorm that never made it that you could go back to and kind of re-nurture and bring those back to the table. So don't be afraid to activate that kill switch if something is just not working the way you thought it was going to. Yep. And Ashley, do you have a similar process or do you find different ways that work for you when you're starting to put together a strategy? Pretty similar. Your due diligence mm-hmm. process is going to be the most imperative uh, process because what yeah. that's going to do is it's going to set the framework for your target market, what you're looking to accomplish, your end goals. I have a very business 101 strategy in what I do. I mean, I'm very marketing driven from like the very basic. So I make everybody that I'm working with, we sit down and we literally write out on pen and paper our target market, our vision, our mission, our goals. And I harp everybody to create a one-year plan, three-year plan, five-year plan. And because what I found is the most success that I have seen is that I always call that plan your infant. You know, the DNA is probably never going to change, but everything about that plan, proposal, whatever you want to call it, it's going to grow and evolve. And I can't tell you how many times that when we start a project and we're getting in the middle of things like, holy cow, that five-year plan seemed like a really good idea for five years, but that's pertinent right now. And so yeah. we'll swap it around. And it gives us like some idea of how much time and energy should be spending on something. So when something starts off as a five-year plan and then moves into my one-year plan, it's a prioritization. And so I think yeah. that, you know, I'm just a little bit more utilizing that infant. And then when questions arise, do we spend money X, Y, Z on this project? When everybody's deliberating and talking about this and confused and doesn't know where to go, I always say, go read your vision and your mission, because if that piece of the puzzle fits into that vision and mission, a home run, then you know you're Mm -hmm. on the right track. If you have to question it, it's probably not where you need to be putting your funds right now. I try to maintain everything to be simple and that we always have that plan to go back to. Yeah. I think you've both mentioned kind of the background and the research and the work that you have to do before you start marketing. And I think most people get ahead of themselves. They have the business, they have the product or service, they want to get it out there. They want people to know about it and they just start blasting information out with no real plan of who their market is and how they're uh, positioning it against competitors or whatever it is. Like it, like anything else, if you're developing a product and you're putting all this time and effort into 
research and development and testing and making sure you have everything right, you need to do the same for your marketing as well. And I think a lot of people don't really consider that or build it into their timeline. Yeah. And I think also that people think marketing is creative ideas. Like we're going to market this product and we're going to have this creative campaign. But honestly, so much of marketing is analytics and research. And transparency. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just, just explaining what you're, what it actually is from the very most basic form. Yeah. I think that we get so immersed in what we all do that we just assume everybody knows the details. Right. And that, like we we want to make something this big giant something and sometimes we forget that we have to like on the most basic form educate right mm-hmm. yeah yeah I, I i see that a lot like working for the pharmaceutical company right like my marketing is more really about educating than it is about marketing the products to people it's like getting yeah. out there and getting facetime and you know and and jen i do think too like people end up wasting time, effort, and money by just throwing things out there instead of having a a plan, like you were saying, you know, like Mm -hmm. they get so caught up and throw it up there that they end up, we call it show up and throw up for pharmaceuticals. (laughs) If you walk in and you just shove everything at people. (laughs) Yeah. I, I also feel like if you are the listener, that's just getting ready to take the plunge into marketing and you're just like, don't even know where you're going yet. I call it going fishing. It's not the worst thing in the world to just go fishing. Try some things, see where your comfort level, see if you can stick with it. And there's nothing wrong with playing with the market, especially when you we have the access of Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and in Twitter. It's okay to go fishing. And then once you have a better recognition of like what is important to you and where you want to go, then get in the due diligence process. Because unless you do your homework, you're just going to spin your wheels. Yeah. I think that leads into the kind of the second question where you go from there. Like when do you guys think that it somebody should expect to start paying for marketing and when should they do it in house versus hiring out? Yeah, I mean, like a quick Google search will tell you that you should spend 7 to 8% of your revenue on marketing, but in my experience, realistically, I've felt that a lot of companies spend closer to five or 6%. And obviously that percentage of revenue is tied directly to what your margins are for that business. So you're going to have the opportunity to spend more closer to 8%, 10% of revenue. If you have larger margins, if you have smaller margins, or if you're not tracking any of this the right way and you don't know, then it's going to be harder for you to cough up eight to 10% of your revenue toward marketing. So it's the easiest budget to cut, especially social media. And it terrifies me because people always trim from social. And honestly, the the integration of social media and PR these days, like Mm. they're one in the same, like your traditional PR efforts, they're still relevant for sure. Cause there's a ton of publications out there that, that reach large audiences, but your social media is basically an arm of your PR function. And to cut that really means that you're putting a risk around how your brand comes across out there. And that always makes me nervous that people think, oh, you just cut the social budget. But mm-hmm. you know, I think the, the, the question about whether to use like an agency partner or an in-house resource, it's so dependent. Like if you have... If you're a, a small business, maybe you have you know four or five people working at the company and everyone is wearing a lot of hats, I see a lot of value in an agency partner because that allows a group of people, you're getting access to more mindshare and a larger talent pool versus if you try to do it yourself or in-house, you're juggling too many other things. So naturally, you're not going to be able to spend as much time thinking about the marketing function as an agency partner would. So Mm -hmm. I see a lot of value there. I think once you get bigger, if if your company continues to grow and you have the benefit of being able to build a team, there's a lot of value there because that group, like they, they live in your world. Like they eat, sleep, breathe, work your company versus an agency who's going to, the good ones will do the best research, the best due diligence. They'll really peek under the hood, get into the mindset of your community, and they can definitely do a great job. 
but they're never going to be abreast of what's happening in real time, the way that your internal team is going to be. Right. So one interesting way that we've done it at my racehorse is the, mar- so we're a, a B to C company. So we're a direct to consumer and we've basically like, while I am the head of marketing, I don't have like a marketing director and a marketing associate. And like the, t- those titles don't exist within my racehorse. It's, various people with different titles in customer experience and content and all this different, all these different categories. And we just all work together. So it feels like a marketing department because it's so collaborative, but it's not in the traditional sense of your org structure. It's not like this is the marketing department kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So if you can lead the charge as the person in the marketing role with your strategy, and tap into those who work in your organization as colleagues. And if you're able to do that in a kind of an efficient way, it could be really impactful in my opinion. And Ashley, I think you've seen both sides of it at the US trotting, right? right? Where they've hired out, but also they have some in-house. So what are your thoughts on it? We had like a really rough go at US trotting. Like it was U.S. Trotting is a board of directors that is pretty vast. It's pretty huge. It's really, uh, from my personal point of view, it's a little too big. But we've got like 50 board members because we have so many niche markets within harness racing. Like U.S. Trotting, first and foremost, is the breed organization, the the breed registry for standard bred racing. You know, if you want to talk about how we're in the position we're in now is in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, every racetrack had a publicity department that were very, very, very consolidated to their specific racetrack. They don't exist anymore. Racing casinos, they wanted to get rid of them. They did a very good job getting rid of them. And so a breed registry like U.S. Trotting, everybody kind of throws at them like, what are you going to do for this sport? You need to fix this. This is your problem now. And so they're like, whoa, we're just a breed registry that recognizes the niche market needs to be met, but like, holy cow. So yeah, they had a marketing department communications that serves as their trade media brilliantly. And with this growing pressure to be consumer driven and not just trade driven, that set uh, our people pretty thin. A couple years ago, they subcontracted a monster company and I wasn't a part of the process then. And unfortunately, it completely fell flat. It was very disappointing. And we're talking $250,000 a year. They hired in this firm. The plan was brilliant. The story was brilliant. I mean, I took a look at everything and I was like, this is going to be huge for us. And I was so thankful to my directors for recognizing this need. No offense to my directors. I love them all dearly. They're a very older generation and they, they took that leap. Fortunately, it didn't work. It did not work at all. During the third term, that firm resigned the day of the Hamiltonian, which is our Kentucky Derby. No. Wow. It, it was sad and upsetting. And here we had spent $750,000. Ah. We don't have $750,000 to spend. And it was devastating. So One of the biggest things that I like to harp on is if you are a newer company or a company that is trying to take that leap into marketing, grab that young guy or gal and work really hard to utilize the services that are free to you currently. Make that URL, get Facebooks, what, you know, save your at whatever the heck you need to be. Take those steps first Start to explore that process. And I think that you're going to know and be able to gauge when you're wearing your people thin. And then once you know that, okay, we're ready to outreach, find a company that's similar to yours, see who they're using, see what they're doing, see if they're happy. And if they are, set up an interview. Because I think that that is the biggest key to, to making you know that effort useful. I, uh, back to us trotting, I applaud the guys there that are working the guys and gals because they are run really thin. I mean, I think we have, I don't know, 25, 30 tracks racing. 
our breed, we breed about 10,000 horses a year. We don't just house harness racing. We house everything with the standard bred breed. So standard breds under saddle, racing under saddle, regular traditional harness racing. They're trying to be the jack of all trade. And that's very difficult to do. So again, it kind of pushes you right back into your original business 101 plan. You know, go go back there. That is going to be a useful tool for you and say, well, we've outgrown ourselves. Let's take this mark. Let's take that next step. Let's go into the interviewing process and interview a ton of firms. And, yeah. and sometimes people say, oh, they don't have any equine experience. I couldn't dare deal with them. That might be the best part. It might mm-hmm. be the best part is that they're totally obscure. And through them educating, you're going to the very, very bottom. And then they're like, you said this and it didn't make any sense to me until you said that. That needs to be addressed. And, you know, brains right. ours that are so immersed, are like, oh, yeah, you're right. Sometimes I forget people don't know the difference between a trotter and a pacer. Right. Because I live it. I, it. Yeah. I watch, watch my earlings and I'm like, okay, look at you, pacer, pace and free legged out there. <laughs> right. I just, it's so innate to me that sometimes I have to go like way to the bottom. Out of, yeah. out of curiosity, was the campaign that didn't work? Was that an awareness campaign? Was it based on media spend around just reaching new fans in the game or, or what was the main goal? The main goal was to literally create a consumer entity that is an educating tool to the public of horse lovers, gamers, and players, gamblers and players. So it was a comprehensive effort to solely not utilize, be utilized as trade media, but to just be sold to the new consumer for growth and education. Why it didn't work, I don't know. I wasn't a part of that process. Things fell in the cracks. From my personal experience, I think I just had my daughter. So I'm thinking like this was like 2012. She's nine. And I remember like I had worked pharmaceutical sales and marketing for quite many years. Moved to the East Coast from the Midwest. And I was probably bored. And I was home with my baby and my farm and doing all like our race or stuff. And I remember like being so excited that this gentleman was taking over in this firm. And I remember messaging him and like emailing him like, Hey, from the Tim teacher point of view, like right now he broke almost every record in harness racing history. He's a cool dude. He's a quiet dude, but he's cool. We get a lot of slack that's saying like, Oh, I reached out to trainers and drivers and they don't want to help. And I was like recognizing like, Whoa, we never got a call from you. Like, here I am. I'm a resource. I'm free because I love the whole sport. And they never responded. And I thought, oh, well, that's kind of weird, you know? And I let it go and I let it go and I let it go. And by the third year, I had enough. And I I actually drove to the board meetings and was like, from a marketing point of view, this is falling so flat. We're spending a lot of money. And I think that we need accountability. You know, where are your metrics? Where's your ROI? What are we doing? What did we spend 250000 I mean, like, I always see a lot of people when they're in the marketing world, they have the ability to talk over someone and above them. And mm-hmm. I was just like, I just want like your bare bones minimum. Like, what did we spend that money on? And when somebody talks over you and above you, don't be afraid to say, whoa, 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 come back down to my level because sometimes that's, that's a tactic. That's good yeah. Like, yeah, really good advice. <laughs> take nothing away from this podcast. Like, that is, I love that. I mean, I'm bringing that on the road because it's so true. <laughs> There's this element of, especially if you do go with an agency and you're, the whole point is to hire people who are smarter than you, right? right. That's what makes you right. a good business person. Right. Yeah sometimes you got to be careful because they can almost like swindle you a little bit. And then you're like, wait a minute, this all sounds really cool, but is there any like substance to it? So that's an amazing piece of life advice to, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. And and when you have that gut feeling, you ask the dumbest question you can think of because man, it is not dumb. Yeah. If they cannot answer that bare bones minimum, eh, it's time to, it's time to just move on. Move on. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you mentioned um, 
metrics and and trying to get answers and kind of hard numbers. And sometimes that is not as tangible in marketing. I think it's easier now that almost everything's digital. What measurements do you guys look for in getting return on investment, the ROI, and what metrics do you think are most important? Most importantly, from a black and white point of view, do growth. Are you growing on social? I'm so simple. I think I'm more simple than I probably realized. I literally utilize that good old Facebook data and I have a spreadsheet and every month on the same day, I fill in my spreadsheet and I really like if I had minimal growth, I make it red. If I've had a lot of growth, I make it green. Luckily, we haven't seen very many, a couple months. We had a couple months where we went a little backwards, which kind of panicked me. It was in the very beginning. We had a lot of people originally follow us. Now, from a T-Trick racing point of view, I do not utilize Facebook as sponsorships. The reason being is that I'm very niche market, very organic. And I think we started in 2015. Um, I just am to a point right now where I'm finally getting a grasp of my organic market and I'm not ready to take that next step. I do everything myself in house. Let me retract that. I have a partner. His name is John Adamski. He's a harness racing fan that literally came up to me at the racetrack. Who's a graphics guy with a NASCAR background. He helps me a ton with graphic design because I'm like just kind of mediocre. And you, if you know me, when you follow teacher racing, you're like, that wasn't Ashley. <laughs> and, um, but right now, for example, I have not taken the jump into hiring an outside firm to assist me in growth. So people might look at teacher racing and go, we're, wow, we're doing such a great job and we're spending very little. I focus a lot of my energy because we're so organic on giveaways and partnership. Like we do, we had a really great last couple of months. We, um, Charlie Oliveira, the UFC lightweight champion, who's the biggest lover of harness horses came to Yonkers and him and my husband did like a match race. And so I had him sign a bunch of things because we do our giveaways and our giveaways they reach, we only have 40,000 followers, but our giveaways all have 150,000 people within those mm. giveaways. And that to me was just bananas. So I'm kind of watching that market. So back to just basic ROI, get that spreadsheet out, utilize data that Facebook and, and Instagram gives you, plug it in. I'm really a weak Instagrammer, which is where I, I'm going to get better. I promise. Um, <laughs> But um, Facebook is is the majority of my population. And then I also have an online store, which was dr- created and driven. We were in Sweden and literally a guy, we were at a race called the Elite Lot. And it is one of the most premier trot races in the world. And my husband was asked to drive a trot, an American trotting mare. And it was just this incredible experience. And I remember getting out of the taxi and I had, it was cold and I had a teacher racing jacket on. And I think it was his. And a guy literally tried to buy it off me on the street. <laughs> and it was like, I thought he was joking. I'm like, you're so cute. You know, like, <laughs> he's like, no, here, I'll buy, I'll buy it. And I'm like, I don't even know the exchange rate. I can't, I can't sell this. <laughs> I made him a deal that if he went and bought me a brand new elite lop jacket, I'd give him my coat. <laughs> I went home and I was like, built my online store. I utilize Shopify. It's very simple logistics and distribution are so bad that it's really stagnant right now. Uh, everything's on back order and there's not a whole lot I can do. But that through teachergracinggear.com, my sales is key. That's what I watch specifically. And as far as US trotting goes, you know, I watch very close to my, I mean, excuse me, teacher racing. Um, on social, I watch the numbers closely. We are just now kind of putting a proposal for US trotting to to track ROI at a, at a bigger level. And I have a very good friend that's in marketing. And I said, hey, I need your help. So let's sit down and you help me build this so that I can then come to the board and say, here's your where your money's spent. But yeah. don't be afraid to just get your black and white budget out. You know, sit yeah. down and look at it. Know your numbers, even from the most basic standpoint. And Shona, on a more in-depth kind of social media level, what kind of metrics are you looking at? Well, it's, I think the, the summary of Ashley's story kind of ties back to 
my take on what ROI is right for you and, and what KPIs are right for you. And that's really, it's all goes back to your goals. So when you put that strategy together, you come up with your goals, there is a KPI that ties back to every goal out there. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's harder to track that KPI and it could be expensive to put the tracking in place for that. But at Grand Slam, from the social media side, we were really focused on engagement. So what a trend that we saw happening is that our company's platforms would grow but the engagement rate would not increase or the number of engagements wouldn't increase. So we were like, what does this mean? Yeah. So I think the platform algorithms are shifting. They're always ever changing. Like they're basically alive and breathing at this point. I don't even know if Facebook knows how its own algorithm works because it's probably at this point so advanced with machine learning and everything that it kind of goes in all these different directions. So, and that's why people are like, how do you make a viral video? I mean, it's really tough to, to figure out what that formula is. But we were really focused on engagement metrics. And then we always were challenged to defend social media all the time. It was always like, why am I paying this much money for social media? And I'm like, do you pay any money for your PR? And they'd be like, no, (laughs) then this is your PR budget. And also, guess what? It can also track back to your business goals. So we would look at a lot of tangible business goals as, as much as we could. And that would be like referrals to the website. So landing page views, any sort of conversion that we could get our hands on. And I think that's how we kind of defended social in a way. And then a business like, let's say Blue Chip Farms, for example, Tom's goal was to get either new people to board mares at his farm, buy shares in his stallions, breed to his stallions, yeah. and, and also at the same time, keep his existing community happy. So it was hard to go to Tom and be like, Oh, well, because you got a hundred thousand engagements this year, you now have this many more mares at your farm. And it's just, it's not apples to apples doing for that. And I think this is the key. It's a mixture of quantitative and qualitative data. That's really going to tell the best story for, you know, whether it's a client, your CEO, even yourself. So for Tom, what we did was we focused on driving more traffic to the Blue Chip Farms website. We redid his yearling pages for the yearling sales and created a, a cleaner looking site. You could look at walking videos, 360 degree confirmation videos, the trotting videos. So we created this new environment, nice and flashy. And then we did a program where we would email, um, you know, if, if, a, if a horse won that was tied back to in pedigree to one of the yearlings that he had coming up at the sale we would email the owners and we had a nice congrats email, a nice clean graphic. Hey, congratulations on your win. So exciting. Hey, by the way, did you know we have a horse that's a similar cross to to your winner? If you're interested, give us a call, come out to the farm. We'd love to host you out there. And that got a ton of positive feedback. So people were responding to the email. Oh my God, Tom, what a great idea. I love this. Yes, I'll definitely come out. And it led to a few actual sales, even ahead of either driving more interest for the bidding at the yearling sales or private sales. So I think it's just a combination of the two and it all goes back to, you know, what your goals are as a business. And mm-hmm. luckily at my racehorse, it is an e-commerce product. So I have like this whole new world of tracking capability for better or for worse. <laughs> so I know exactly who's registered, who's converted, how much they're purchasing. It's all tagged and tracked on Google analytics and then in the Google data studio and all these different fun tools we have. So if you're lucky enough to work in a business that does have an e-commerce product where you can follow the breadcrumbs digitally, amazing. Yeah. If you work in a more traditional business like a breeding farm or consignment, then you are going to have to get a little bit more creative with what that, that qualitative story is as well. Yeah. I think one thing you mentioned, like KPIs, like those key performance indicators are going to be different for everybody. And you're going to even recognize within your own KPIs, they're going to change. So engagements for me, it's the biggest thing right now. Sharing for me, probably the next biggest thing right now on a small little itty bitty scale. When I go to US Trotting and we build what their KPI is supposed to look like, I it's going to be completely opposite of what Teacher Racing's is. Mm. Um, maybe not opposite, maybe a little parallel, but you're going to recognize when you I don't know why I always go back to it, but my business 101 strategy, your KPIs are going to be a a portion of that bottom. You're going to build your everything one, three, and five-year plan. 
And then you're going to put like, as of today, this is what my key performance indicators are and date it so that when you go back to look at like what you're doing and that changes, the biggest key is not, did it change? Why did it change? Was it because you didn't have enough information? Did, was it because you had way too much information? Is it because you had too much influence from one person? Like a lot of people always come to me and they're like, oh, we want to see this on teacher gracing and we want to see that on teacher gracing. And to be honest with you, a cup of coffee, a picture of Tim's cup of coffee in the morning that says good morning brings the most amount of interaction <laughs> for the day. So yeah, why am I it's crazy. Tons of money, you know, to have videography, which I think is important. And we're in the middle of building that. But when I'm looking at my day and like what my analytics were, huh, a cup of coffee works. <laughs> They're overdo it. But, you know, recognize from the most simple form what people are attracted to. You know, Tim is kind of funny because if you know him very well from a racing point of view, he is a serious dude, like tough, serious very black and white. You don't have to put me up on your racehorse, but if I'm in that race, you got to race against me. He is the ROI most driven human being and he doesn't even know it. But like on like the guy at home is so different. Like mm -hmm. we, we have rodeo horses. So like I barrel race and rope, he ropes. And like, I remember one day he was like, don't put that picture of us roping on teacher crazy. I was like, why? It's cool. I don't really want to talk about it. He's like, I don't want, I don't want to talk about it. And when I want to go to the track and talk about it, he's like, when I go to the track, I want to go to work. I don't want to talk about home. And when I come home, I don't want to talk about work. So I was just like, well, you're going to have to get over that. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like you're, you're going to have to find a happy medium. And, um, and, and it took a little bit of time for him to be comfortable with like putting his life out there. And it's inevitable that you, you do have to be vulnerable and you do have to be prepared to open your home. And again, I think that is for horse racing in its entirety is we do so many incredible things. That, and, that actually, that was going to be my next question was, what do you think that we do the best in horse racing and Shona as well? But what do you think that, that we do that other industries could take away from? What's the best thing? Other compared to other equestrian industries racing alone we have such an incredible amount of horsemanship and care and involvement and one-on-one -on -one. there's nobody that knows their horse more than their groom and second their groom number one their trainer number two their owner is probably like eight because the blacksmith knows about him their six vets yeah. know about him the turnout facility probably knows more about that horse that's a tool that if we could show other racing entities in the world, if they knew how cared for these animals are, I think that transparency and that clear depiction is pivotal in growth. Because mm -hmm. I think human nature, correct me if I'm wrong, if they don't know or if they don't see it or if they're not told, they assume the worst. And they will believe an untruth before they will believe a truth. So we can't tell people how great we are. We have to show them. Yeah. And Shona, from your perspective, what do you think? Similar feelings about the industry. I think I think the stories mm -hmm. that I've come across are incredible. Just the where people have come from, how far they've come, how the relationship with a horse can inspire you and help you grow as a person. And, mm -hmm. you know, these animals give so much, they ask for nothing in return and they can fulfill us all in a way that I don't think anybody really understands unless they've been around horses, worked with them. And I don't think you even need to be physically in contact with the horse for a horse to change your life or inspire you. So one amazing thing about what I've learned through my racehorse is we hear about all these stories from the people who become owners. We have 30,000 owners right now. And they'll message us all the time and say, you know, I've been battling cancer and I bought into this horse and following his story has just been such a highlight of the last couple of months when I've been in a difficult place. And thank you so much for the experience. And over 5,000 people owned authentic 
who won the Kentucky Derby in 2020 and just the stories that poured in about what that meant to people and how it's life changing. And they never even, most of them never even met authentic, but the connection to that horse. And I mean, the horses that I feel really close to aside from my own tone pone, he's the best ever. Um, <laughs> the legend, <laughs> the legend tone pone. Yep. He's, still going. he's 25 now. So, uh, I've like been in positions where like, I remember one time this horse that I was really you know, following and was really connected to won a race. And like, I thought I was going to pass out. Like my legs were like, they stopped working. They were shaking. Cause I was so excited and proud. I've never felt that before. And just the whole, it's like a full body experience. And my racehorse brand was kind of centered around discover the thrill. And there is really nothing like it when you are part of that connection, those connections, when a horse wins, it's magic. So the stories, the experience, I think we have a lot of smart people thinking about how we can grow the sport, bring more people in. And I think by continuing to share the stories of those involved in the industry, it's a really good place to start. Yeah. Awesome. We've had so much fun talking with you guys today and helping our listeners learn more about marketing. You guys are such a great wealth of information. So we really appreciate it. At the end of each episode, we do the same rapid fire questions for each guest. And Connor usually starts with the first question. Yeah. So what is one action that women can take to make a big difference in their lives? Ashley, you want to start? Yeah. Uh, Surround yourself with other great women. Like (laughs) just have the girlfriends that you know, you can send a document to say, read this. I need it by five in the morning. Or um, <laughs> It doesn't matter uh, to call her and say your coffee's out. I don't know. But the people that are good to you and close to you and care for your dreams and goals, keep them close. I like that. And she- yeah, that's a great one. My answer to this is just to be honest. And it takes a lot of different forms. So I think so many issues arise when we don't speak our mind and there's a way to do it right. There's a way to do it tactfully. Like take it with a grain of salt. Don't be honest with your boss when you're mad that you didn't get a promotion or that they're making you do something you don't want to do. And then you just go off on a tangent. What I mean is just to be honest in your relationships, whether it's your marriage, your kids, your friends, be honest with your colleagues, your boss, be honest with yourself. Don't get caught up in all the different bells and whistles out there that can kind of bring you in various directions. I think that if you can really track back to being honest with all of those stakeholders in your life, including yourself, then that's going to set you on the right path. And Ashley, what is the best habit that keeps you motivated personally? Within every negative experience, every loss, everything that comes into your life that's not terrific, find one positive thing about it. Just one. Walk away, be able to say one positive thing, whether it's, I am never going there again and I am never doing that again. That's okay. So grow, you'll, every time you bring up one thing, you'll grow as a better person. And Chona, what is the best habit that keeps you motivated personally? This one was easy. Self-care. <laughs> the world moves so fast. Marketing moves even faster. I have found that you, I just can't survive unless I take the time. I'm, on Sundays, I just try to unplug. I spend the day with my daughter. I don't check my phone. I, I try to unwind as much as possible. But I think that taking time for yourself, just having that opportunity to recharge your batteries, is just gonna it's gonna set you up for success down the line. Cool. And Shona, what's your favorite horse movie? Man, I don't want to sound basic, but like Sea Biscuit is the oh, best. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the movie's amazing, but like the book is just it's awesome. So I think. <laughs> If you combine the two, I, I, yeah, I got to go with Sea Biscuit. I read the other day. Have you guys ever read the Funny Side book? No. no. Oh, you got to read it. But Sea Biscuit <laughs> my favorite movie. But I was uh, had a long trip the other day, and I had the Funny Side on a listening book. I loved it. <laughs> Absolutely loved it. Awesome. <laughs> Yay. I love book recommendations. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Great. You guys, that was, it was awesome. It was great talking to you and getting connected since we all kind of, you know, in the horse world small, um, and we had a connection between blue chip. And so it was great talking to you. Yeah, it's been fun. 
I think I learned a lot too. So I'm going to take some of Ashley's tips and apply them to my my own hair. Same. (laughs) Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. That was a great discussion. I think both of them had such tangible information that people can take and use right away. Yeah, definitely. They both had such a in-depth knowledge of marketing, but keeping it simple, which I liked Ashley's take on, you know, how to keep it simple and Shona talking about like the KPIs that people have. I think that's really important information for people to have. We really didn't get to talk too much about it. A lot of times when we were talking about whether you should hire it out or whether you should have it in-house... I feel like it really is going to depend on how your business is, right? Like if you're in the barn, yeah, you're taking pictures and trying to post, but like I've heard some feedback from people, especially in, in the barn situation, like having a stable that they don't want to take away from the care of the horses to like stop and worry about posting on social media immediately. So I think that's one place where like if you had somebody that you can designate, whether it's somebody that's in-house or an agency to do that for you. I think that a lot of people would probably be better off doing that. Right. Like you said, it's very dependent on how your business is structured and where you want to see your business go. But I think no one can ignore the fact that you need marketing and social media is a big part of that now. So it was cool to learn more about what they do and you know how they accomplish the different marketing aspects for the companies that they've been in you know Shona has the agency experience and now she's that in-house person <laughs> doing it for a company so it was cool to have those perspectives as well yeah i definitely enjoyed talking to them and i hope that our listeners can get some good nuggets out of there for sure Find the links to today's guests and the show notes at www.eqbusinesswomen.com. Equestrian B2B is out twice a month on the 1st and the 15th. You can find out more at eqbusinesswomen.com and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Find Equestrian B2B wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to follow, subscribe, and leave a review. You can have all 20 plus shows of the Horse Radio Network with you wherever you go with their free app for iPhone and Android. Go to your app store and search Horse Radio Network. Now go market your company. 